Hi everyone, I'm your host Yuvi Ivanova. Welcome to part two of our interview with Daniel Jeffries. In this episode, we talk about the biggest mistakes that Daniel's made as a crypto trader and the most important things he learned from the most successful traders out there. To get the show notes from this episode, go to cryptoradio.io slash Daniel2. And if you haven't heard the first part of this interview, go to cryptoradio.io slash Daniel1. The next part of this interview will be available at cryptoradio.io slash Daniel3. This episode is brought to you by BitGuild.io. BitGuild is a new gaming platform built using blockchain technology. Their mission is to redefine the relationship between gamers and game developers. On the BitGuild platform, gamers maintain full ownership and control of their virtual items, which are stored on the blockchain. They can transfer items and progress between compatible games, and they can make in-game transactions safely and cheaply, and sometimes free. Developers who join the platform will get a direct link to an established player base with a strong community and a network of like-minded developers building on the same platform. Developers will also have the potential for direct game development funding from BitGuild. The first version of the BitGuild portal is now live. You can log in with MetaMask, buy the Plat token, and play BitGuild's first game, Ether Online. They now have a full inventory wallet system for in-game items. In the coming weeks, the marketplace will be implemented and several independent developers are joining the site to bring their unique games to the BitGuild family. Go to cryptoradio.io slash play to start playing and join the BitGuild official Discord server to connect with the team. Welcome to Crypto Radio. We interview the top thinkers and entrepreneurs in the blockchain and cryptocurrency industry. We also cover topics like trading, investing and ICOs. We're your hosts, Mike Gilliland, Michael Pohl, Chris Sparks, and UVI Bonova. We're entrepreneurs, crypto investors, and co-founders of a new blockchain investment platform called CoSyndicate.io. We created CoSyndicate and Crypto Radio to make crypto investing a better experience for you. If you're new to the show and you'd like a list of our top episodes and resources, go to CryptoRadio.io slash start. If you like our podcast, you can subscribe, share, and follow us on social media and leave us a rating and a review on iTunes and elsewhere. It helps others find the show and we really appreciate it. You can find all those links at CryptoRadio.io slash start. What have been some of your biggest failures or some of your biggest hard learned lessons in trading? So I've got a number of them. I would say in the early days of trading the regular stock markets, getting involved with triple ETFs, uh, particularly around precious metals and financial stocks during the dot-com go-go days, uh, was a total disaster for me. I was getting eaten up live by fees. I was buying and trading them on a complete whim, thinking that I understood which way the wind was blowing. I really had absolutely no idea what I was doing. It was interesting that I didn't have a lot of money then. And it was actually just after the dot-com crash that this was happening. And I was trading. So I was subject to the pattern day trader rule that had come into effect after the crash of the dot-coms. And that rule was designed to make sure that if you had less than $25,000 in the market, you could not do more than three day trades in a month. And I remember being furious about the rule because I thought, you know, this is my money. I know what I'm doing and, and I can make these decisions. And in fact, I had actually no idea what I was doing. I probably would have lost all of the little money that I had in the market. I still, in many ways, don't agree with the rule. I do, however, understand the spirit of the rule. I do agree with the spirit of the rule. And what they were trying to do was say, look, if you don't know what you're doing, if you're a novice, take a pause. Don't go crazy. Don't try to day trade all the time. And unfortunately, you can't really make a rule like that. There's no kind of characteristic that you can lock into that says somebody is a novice or not. There's no test you can give them or whatever. And so what they do is they kind of settle for this half-assed hack, which is, okay, if you have a lot of money, you must know what you're doing. And if you don't have a lot of money, you don't know what you're doing. And of course, that's not true. I know many rich people have no idea what they're doing and many poor folks who know exactly what they're doing or we'd never have any bankruptcies. However, I still agree with the spirit of the rule and I really didn't know what the hell I was doing. After I made more 
money. I've made, you know, I've made other types of terrible mistakes, you know, getting a sense of doom. You know, you get this sense of doom about the marketplace. You watch too much of the news. I no longer watch any news. I think it's uh, in many ways just the way to be afraid all the time. If there's something really important that I need to know, then it'll find me. It's really not, (laughs) it's not hard. So I just have taken a permanent news fast, although occasionally something that comes across my feed that I see, but I try not to pay attention, but you always see these doom and gloomers in the market, right? Somebody's always predicting the end of the stock market. And of course, a stopped clock has the right time twice a day and a blind squirrel will find a nut every once in a while. So eventually one of these guys is right and they go, what a genius, you know, <laughs> market crashed right after he said it, except he said it 25 times. It's like those guys who predict the end of the world, they're like, it's on June 12th, you know, this year, and then June 12th comes. They're like, oh, I just, I read the scriptures wrong. You know, I didn't have the Akasic records down. So it's actually August 36th. (laughs) Well, well, yeah, but there will be when the cosmic calendar, you know, it's just, it's nonsense, right? And so I've had a couple moments like that where I just pulled all my money out. I was sure doom and gloom was coming. And I've gotten a lot better with it and settled with it. There have been times where I have actually seen a market crash coming, but it has been more of an understanding of my indicators than, you know, just the, the sense of like, uh, the wind is turning, like nuclear annihilation is coming and the markets will crash, right? It's a, that kind of nonsense. And I would say probably the worst trade I ever made was just fomoing into NEO when it was on its sort of rocket ride. And I remember it was just rocketing up and then I just watched it crash and burn away all of my money and I just could not let it go. It was one of the first times that that had ever happened to me. That was sort of one where I just couldn't, I couldn't let it go. And I just watched it burn up money and the more it burned, the more I held. And it was, it was a painful lesson to learn. Sometimes I've talked about that in some of my articles and I remember somebody posted uh, you know, someone in the comments and they said, well, you know, ironically, if you had just held on even longer, it would have come back and then some. And I'm like, that is not a trading strategy. That is bullshit. That is 2020 hindsight in action. That is not how the fucking world works. Nice try. Okay. There is no guarantee that any asset comes back, right? There are numerous times when things go dead. I mean, look at something like how many projects are out of, are gone now in the crypto space, right? You go back and look at the historical snapshot of top 100 coins and they're gone. They're just gone. They're gone. So anybody who thinks that an asset, you just hold it forever and it'll automatically come back is totally delusional. In, in the regular markets, you look at something like Enron, okay? And people held Enron from $100 or $90 at its peak to 50 cents. There were people who actually sold at 50 cents, That is how delusional the human mind is when you get attached to something. So that was an incredibly painful lesson, and I have vowed never to make it again. I have ruthlessly tight stops. I spent all my time learning portfolio management. In fact, learning you know when to enter and exit is the like completely, completely, completely secondary to risk management and portfolio management. It's every great trader eventually learns that. Uh, You have got to have a clear plan to stop bleeding when things are going wrong because they will go wrong. It is as simple as that. You are playing a gambling game of probability and people don't want you to believe that. Every website out there will tell you it's not gambling. It's totally different. Sorry, but the math is precisely the same. (laughs) When you study the mathematics of game theory and probability and statistics, of games and gambling, it is precisely the same thing. There's a stigma attached to gambling, and obviously there's gambling addiction. I don't ever want to make light of that. It's a serious disease that ruins lives. But the fact is that you are better off studying probability, portfolio management, the mathematics behind games and gambling to get better at trading because they are literally the same thing. Yeah. And psychology as well, because when you're competing with a bunch of other irrational monkeys, then it helps to know how irrational monkeys work. (laughs) We are all irrational monkeys. We are all advanced monkeys and totally irrational. And actually, original game theory, the biggest problem with it, and the biggest problem with early economics, was that we believed that people were ideally rational and always made the rational decision. That is totally insane. Nobody is rational. Nobody always makes the correct decision. There is no perfect information disclosure. Information is asymmetrically distributed. 
and asymmetrically processed, imperfectly processed by each individual mind to the best of their ability and to the best of most people's ability is woefully lacking. And then the other thing they started to discover was not just how people behaved individually when they would run a test, but how they would behave when there was an authority figure telling them something or when they were in groups and the people go absolutely nuts in groups. They act totally differently in groups and they act totally different when there's an authority figure versus when they're on their own. We'd like to believe we're all masters of the free will and that we came to our own clear understanding of the universe. And the fact is we are a bunch of biological algorithms running around doing the best we can to interpret information in a chaotic world, right? It is not something that is easy for the average person to understand. It's not even easy for the professional or the clear-minded individual to understand, right? It is very challenging and uh, something that very few people are able to get right because trading is uh, going against these kind of basic instincts and this sort of these basic biases and shortcuts that we take with the marketplace and what, that we take with information. There are two sort of interesting psychological experiments. One is in the early days, they were uh, trying to solve epilepsy. They, somebody had the brilliant idea to cut the cord between the left and the right hemisphere in people's brains. Not a great idea. Did not solve epilepsy. Unfortunately, there are some good things that came of it and that these people were very interesting to study because there is a disconnect between both sides of the brain. And so they could show information to like just the left eye or the right eye. And since the brain couldn't communicate across, they would have different interpretations of what they saw. And what they found is a lot of times the people would believe they saw something different because their brain filled in something because they didn't actually see it or they were lying to themselves about what they saw, right? In other words, they, they just didn't observe it. So their brain just kind of fills in a pattern that doesn't exist. And that's one of them. And then the other one that's famous is the famous experiment where they, you have to shock somebody and you have to keep raising the shock. And most people, when they're on their own, will just refuse to do it after a period of time, right? They'll say, okay, well, this is too much of a shock. I'm not going to cause pain to someone else. And then when they put an authority figure in the room, just like a an assistant or someone in a lab coat whose job it was to say, you have to do this. Something like 85% of people kept ratcheting it up to the ultimate pain level while the other person is screaming on the other side. And of course, it was, they weren't really shocking the person on the other side. It was just an actor, you know, just <laughs> acting in agonizing pain. But people would absolutely ratchet it up to the top pain level because they were sort of told to. So all of these things filter in to how we do things. When we go and look at sentiment, we're looking at kind of this group mind think or when, we're, when we have other people that we think are better than us or authority figure to us or someone who's important to us. We, we tend to discount our own understanding of it and just go along with what they tell us to do. And then there's also just the tricks that our mind plays that makes it impossible to actually see any of the patterns in front of us. All of these things are working against us as a trader. It's, it's actually amazing that anybody makes money. And it goes back to kind of the snarky theory of the random walk that a bunch of monkeys throwing darts at a stock chart can pick better than the, the average person. And they've actually run statistics on this. And the snarky comment on that was that the random walk was incorrect. The monkeys were not just better they were actually significantly better at <laughs> darts and a paper than the average person picking a stock. So if that's not a humbling experience for you as a trader, I, I really don't know what is. It's like placebo being better than the expensive cure. That's right. So floating in a sea of chaos with a bunch of irrational monkeys in a market for a new asset class that doesn't make any sense... How do you make sense of it? So I go back to a lot of my sort of philosophical training and, and my critical thinking training. A lot of the things that I prize in other aspects of my life have been very useful in my personal training. And uh, my friend Jordan Greenhall, 
who's a brilliant uh, venture capitalist, he once said, he's, he's just a brilliant mind. And he was talking to me and he said, he used to talk to people about these far out ideas that he had and, and people were just sort of staring at him with me go, my, my eyes glaze over like this sort of dumb founded slack jaw. And he knew that they weren't understanding where he said, but he found that there were three types of people that very quickly understood exactly what he was talking about. And he said that they were special forces soldiers ER technicians, and traders. And the reason is because in all of those professions, something really bad happens if you don't objectively see what is true versus what you imagine to be true. If you're a soldier, right, you either die or someone else dies or someone you care about dies if you're not paying attention and seeing clearly. If you're an ER tech, obviously someone passes away under your care and because of that. And lastly, as a trader, you can lose a lot of money if you are not seeing things clearly. So I really think that it is a process of kind of disconnecting your lizard brain, disconnecting these kind of heuristics that our mind uses. And by the way, heuristics are not bad. The lizard mind gets this kind of sense that we shouldn't use it or it makes us dumb or we are kind of ignorant logical fallacies. And to me, sometimes are not really fallacies. It's sort of a misnomer. To me, they're mental heuristics. When I am traveling on a train in a new place, I'm aware of everything around me. Seeing all the buildings and street signs, I'm taking it all in. If I stay there for a few days, I'll start to not notice everything again as I'm taking that train. My brain is filling in the patterns for me. That is an energy-saving mechanism, and it's highly useful. If we had to process all of the ridiculous level of information that was coming at us every second, every, every leave moving on the tree, everything everyone was saying to us, we would crumple into a fetal position and we would be eating 24 hours a day to try to replace our energy. So these heuristics are actually useful in a lot of things in our life. It's just that they are not useful in trading. And so one of the important things to do is to really kind of disconnect that lizard brain And just kind of get used to looking directly at the screen, get used to going with your indicators and really start to turn it into an algorithmic process. An algorithm is a series of repeatable steps. And I remember a great trader who talked about this where he said he had developed his algorithms over time and... He would usually follow them, but every once in a while, he'd start to kind of get an instinct and he'd go against it. Sometimes it would work and sometimes he'd start losing money. And so what if it did work, he would start to go back and say, okay, what was I doing there? What was I thinking about? What were the steps I were taking? What did I notice? And then he would incorporate that as a sub algorithm into his algorithm. And eventually over 20, you know, 20 or 30 years of his trading, he is able to kind of incorporate that sort of trader's instinct or trader's wisdom into a series of repeatable steps. So he's really utilizing a a mechanical system, really a series of steps. I think that to be successful, you have to be an algorithmic trader, even if you are not having a computer do the trading for you. You have to develop a system through trial and error, through losing money and making money, through the process of constant critical thinking, self-iteration, self-understanding, so that you are very quickly looking at something in a very dispassionate, scientific, objective way at making a decision and sticking with the decision. And that is really, I think, the way that people become successful over time. It is incredibly challenging, but all of the kind of historical study that I've done on this and all of the great traders whose biographies I've consumed and uh, personal notes uh, that I have consumed come to that conclusion eventually. You have to become an algorithmic trader. Yeah, it makes sense because if you don't take note of what you're doing and you're just reacting to what's happening, a lot of that is very unconscious. And then if somebody asks you, oh, well, how did you do that? Or, or why did you win on that trade or lose on that trade? You won't even be able to tell them. So that's why you have to 
pay attention and, and develop a strategy because otherwise it's just not replicable. Yeah, many people will keep a journal over time. And by the way, the trader I was talking about was Ed Sakoda. He's potentially the greatest trader who's ever lived. Also like a kind of walking Buddha. He's sort of super philosophical. You can read about him in, in Market Wizards and some other places. He actually has a newsletter that he keeps up. He has a, a website, it looks like, from 1990. It's kind of wonderfully homey and down to earth. And he has these trading tribes that he sets up. And really, in the trading tribes, nobody talks about anything except their emotions and managing their emotions. They don't talk about specifics of the trades or they talk about kind of getting their psychology right so that they can kind of develop the algorithm. And he sort of developed some of the first algorithms that he tested on computers. So he was actually programming the algorithms against these big mainframes. He took a crappier job because the company was falling apart so that he could get access to the mainframe while, while the company was falling apart to test his theories. And I don't recommend that to everyone, but sometimes you got to do what you got to do. And he was testing all these theories that all of these traders would have. Uh, I think he was trading with Jesse Livermore, the legendary trader, and he had all these kind of rules that he'd made up and Ed would test them. And he would find, yeah, a lot of these worked and a lot of them were not so good. And also some of them were not able to be put into an algorithm. They were kind of these fuzzy human algorithms that were more about gut instinct. And so he kept trying to move it towards a more formal process, right? And so he was one of the first folks to get algorithmic trading. And he said the way that he does it is he has a very small group of people that he's had over, over a long period of time. He, his computers run their simulation and they output a trade. He doesn't have trading screens even in this house. He's not watching it. He just looks at what the computer tells him to do and he, uh, he inputs it and he does other stuff for the rest of his life. Uh, that to me is the ideal. To me, it's a kind of is the ideal trader, the trader everyone should look into deeply. Uh, he's the type of trader that it is easy to miss his wisdom because he is so dialed in. He's so matter of fact that some people think he's being a snarky bastard when he answers their questions, when he's actually telling them the direct truth as clear a fashion as you can. Like somebody asked him a question at a conference, how do I know when the market is going up? And he said, when the market is going up. <laughs> so, if, and so obviously, if you're not paying attention, if you don't understand that, what he means is there's no prediction. Okay, a lot of folks are trying to make these predictions with technical analysis and with all these things. It doesn't work like that. It's more about looking at confirmations of reversals and changes and then going with that sort of uh, trend over time. Or having a system that, if you are going to predict reversals, understanding that it's more of a probability game than you being a great sage. So Ed Sakota is a trend follower, which is close to my own style. So he's essentially saying, you can't really predict the future. You can only, you cut with the grain. You go with it when it's going up, and you go short it when it's going down. It's easier said than done, being able to see those two things. But you, you can only confirm it after the fact. On the other hand, someone like Paul Tudor Jones does try to catch reversals because he feels like that bounce, that big initial bounce when something hits a bottom is where a lot of the meat of the trade is. But the way that he does it is very different than I think how most folks in the crypto space do it, where they draw a bunch of lines and they go, it's going to hit this line. As soon as it hits this line, boom, I'm a genius. And they post that on Twitter. It's like, yeah, but they didn't post the other five that they missed where it plunged right through that line. So that's understanding reality, understanding that mostly it's going to go through your line. And so Paul basically incorporated that into his algorithm. So what he does is instead of using a wide stop, like a trend follower, he's more about protecting his risk. And so he sets a very tight stop. He's essentially saying, if it's been going down and I think it's going to reverse, I am going to go ahead and just bet that it's going up. And if I'm wrong about it, it's going to get stopped out very quickly. It's going to be a very tight stop. Mm -hmm. And he generally will be getting the paper of how he was this genius and he caught this reversal, but they have deliberately left out that he had five different reversals that got stopped out on the way, trying to guess the, the turning point. And so that is a strategy as well. That's something where you can try to 
catch these turns, but you have a very sharply calculated stop that allows you to be wrong because you will be wrong. And so this is what I talk about and why I want people to be able to look at things in actuality. Because when you have a clear understanding of, hey, nobody's going to get reversals right all the time. In fact, you're going to be wrong more often than you're not. That is a fact. That is an understanding that is realistic. It's built in reality. When you have that information and you can see that clearly, then you can define an effective system based on the correct information. If you start from the incorrect information, you are inevitably wrong. You cannot have a correct solution. If you start from the wrong premise, you have a wrong solution, period. Every other step you take is wrong. It's like the long division problems in school that I hated, right? The first one, you, you know, you get the first part wrong and the, the, all the other 50 steps are wrong, right? That mm -hmm. is how life works. That's how trading works. And so you have to develop the ability to see clearly and get objective information and then build your system to go along with that reality. That's really the only way to become successful. All right, that's it for this episode. Thanks for listening. To get the show notes, go to cryptoradio.io slash Daniel2. To hear the first part of this interview, go to cryptoradio.io slash Daniel1. The next part will be available at cryptoradio.io slash Daniel3. And to play blockchain games from our sponsor BitGuild, go to cryptoradio.io slash play. If you're new to the show and you'd like a list of our top episodes and resources, go to CryptoRadio.io slash start. If you like our podcast, you can subscribe, share and follow us on social media and leave us a rating and a review on iTunes and elsewhere. It helps others find the show and we really appreciate it. You can find all those links at CryptoRadio.io slash start. And finally, if you want to be a sponsor of our show, go to CryptoRadio.io slash sponsor. Thanks for listening and we'll see you in the next episode.